Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry about that minor hiccup. I'm Audrey Russo. I'm president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, and I am so thrilled for today. I'm just going to take a few minutes to sort of set the stage for what's happening here and to thank all the people who make this work possible. So I am joined here today by Maria, Marie Poloni. We have too many Maries in our office. The STEM engagement coordinator for our nonprofit arm, which is called 40 by 80, which represents the longitude and latitude of Pittsburgh. So we are so thrilled to have you join us today for this virtual STEM summit. I believe today is day five. And we have just been packed with just incredible information and from presenters. Today, we have the masterminds of cybersecurity at BNY Mellon. We've had over a thousand different people registered, including students, parents, and educators that actually come from over 130 school districts. We are very excited by this work. Many of you may be learning about the Pittsburgh Technology Council in 40 by 80 for the very first time today. So let me just tell you really briefly about it. We are an organization that is a group of more than a thousand local technology businesses, manufacturing firms, and those who are in the life sciences. These companies come together to help make our region amazing so that it's a great place for people to live, for people to work, for people to build their futures. And that's what we're about today. So what's the most important thing? People, the talent that we develop here so that people can help build Pittsburgh for tomorrow. And we are very excited by that. And that's why we do this work. So you are gonna have an opportunity to hear about, about jobs that you might be really surprised about. And you are not gonna believe the kind of opportunities that are available for these jobs. I'm so thrilled that you're gonna get behind the scenes with BNY Mellon. So just really quickly, this is being recorded. So thanks to Pittsburgh PCTV, it's being simultaneously broadcast and available on demand on PC TV or by downloading their app on Apple TV, Roku, and Fire TV. If you live in the city, you can find it on Channel 21, on Comcast, or Channel 47. So I, you heard me mention about Marie from 40 by 80. I'm going to pass the baton to her, but I want you to know that we launched this organization to specifically help school districts and technology businesses to work together. We need this partnership. That's the only way we are gonna transform education and the future for tomorrow. So to that, we hired our math and science teacher, Marie. She is, a, she's working, thanks right now, to PNC, who their charitable organization is helping us bring STEM industry leaders into the middle school classrooms and then those students whose offices and laboratories are the STEM industry. So I'm, here's Marie. Take it away. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you also to PMI for kicking us off with that amazing opening video. And thanks to everybody who is on here today and join, join us. I'm Marie Poloni, the STEM Engagement Coordinator for PTC's charitable organization, 40 by 80. And today and each day of the STEM Summit, we really wanna make sure we have maximum engagement from all of you. So if you look down on the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a place where you're able to raise your hand and you're able to ask questions in our Q&A. We wanna ensure that you understand this is very secure. They can't see your name, they can't see your question, only we can as hosts. And I'm gonna do my very best to ask our leaders from BNY Mellon today, each of those questions as they come up. Also, there's gonna be some polling today. The team at BNY Mellon came up with some really great, great questions to throw back out at all of you when those appear on your screen. Um, choose your answer and you can see how your answers compare to everybody else's. Um, I think that's it for today. I think the time has come for us to finally meet the members of the BNY Mellon's team. We're gonna kick it off first with Dave Sylvester and then we're gonna also meet Sarab Singh today. Great, thanks so much, Marie. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and greetings to everybody. I hope you're learning a lot in this great virtual STEM summit that the Pittsburgh Technology Council has produced. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I have just a couple of slides for you so that we can share with you what, what, what does BNY Mellon do? Many of you probably don't have any idea what BNY Mellon is other than seeing our logo on top of uh, one of the skyscrapers in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, so I wanted to just take a minute before we turn it over to Saurabh to, to uh, really share this exciting content that he has. Um, I'm the chief operating officer of one of the large technology divisions based here in Pittsburgh. And I just wanted to mention that because 
that's another STEM path for you to think about. So I started as a software engineer, but now I'm responsible for the business operations of a group of about 2,500 people around the world. So really exciting role that I get to, to play. Uh, I'm also part of our leadership team here in the, on the Pittsburgh campus and certainly a friend to the Pittsburgh Technology Council. So always happy to be involved in PTC events whenever I can. <clears throat> so there are a lot of numbers on this screen, but I, I wanna just share a few of them with you and try to explain very briefly what our business is, what do we do? So our company has been around for over 235 years and we're not necessarily a bank, but we're definitely a financial services company. Um, we have about 48,000 people around the world within the company and of those about 6,500 are based right here in Pittsburgh. We were founded in 1784 by Alexander Hamilton. Yep, that guy. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. So that makes us the, the longest running bank in the United States. A couple figures that I want you to just keep in the back of your mind and we'll, we'll get back to them in a minute. So those two numbers kind of in the middle of the page, those two very big dollar numbers. So $35.2 trillion of assets under custody and $1.8 trillion of assets under management. So remember those numbers and I'm gonna come right back to them in just a minute. So I want to explain really the two big parts of our business. And again, we're, we're not a bank. You can't come visit our skyscraper and walk in and, and be in a branch. We don't have tellers there. Um, but let me tell you the two things that we primarily do. So, and I know I'm speaking to a lot of students, so just imagine, or you, you may have some experience with this, perhaps your parents have gone to visit a financial advisor and they've said, I have this money and I have these goals. I want you to help me invest this money so that I can reach my financial goals. Well, that's investment management. That's what's on the left side of the top of the screen. That's what we do for a lot of clients. We help them to invest their assets to reach their financial goals. But we don't do that for individuals like you and me or your parents. We do that for other banks. We do that for big companies. We do that for foundations. All of those groups that you see at the bottom of the slide in terms of who are BNY Mellon's clients. So that's a big part of our business. That's about $1.8 trillion, that first number that I wanted you to remember from the prior slide. So we actively manage about $1.8 trillion of our clients' assets. But think back now to your parents going to visit that financial advisor. And after, after they've written that check and the advisor's investing their money, your parents are going to get a monthly statement. Um, maybe they're going to, maybe one of the investments that they have paid a dividend. So they're going to get a dividend check. Um, figuring out the value of, say, a mutual fund that they've invested in, that takes accounting, uh, mutual fund accounting. All of those things that I just mentioned, payments, mutual fund accounting, that's all part of investment services. Those are some of the behind the scenes things that BNY Mellon does to support the financial industry. And that's the bigger of the two numbers, that $35.2 trillion number. What does that number mean? That's the value of the assets that we provide those kinds of services for. And just to give you an idea of how big $35.2 trillion is, you may remember from a social, uh, social studies class, the term GDP, gross domestic product. So what's that? That's the total value of all the goods and services that a whole country produces in a year. Well, if you look at the top two GDPs or the top two economies in the world, the United States economy and the Chinese economy, and you put them together, they total about $35 trillion. So our company is responsible for handling assets that are as big as the, the GDPs of the United States and China combined. So that gives you some idea of how big our business is and how important we are to the financial services um, world. And that leads us to our topic for today is cybersecurity. So as you might imagine, safeguarding that much money on behalf of our clients around the world requires that we really have the absolute best minds working on cybersecurity to make sure that our systems are protected. And I just wanted to share a couple of highlights from our cybersecurity program before we turn it over to Sarab. So if you think about it, um, this is such an important thing. We have to do this um, using some standards that are established, and you'll see a few of those noted on the screen. So there are standards by standards bodies called ISO, and there's another one called NIST, and many others. So just to give you an idea that there are 
Um, there are standards produced by these groups that help to guide us and all financial services companies as to how we safeguard our information. Well, we also are only successful in doing this through the cooperation that we have with some of our peers in financial services, our clients help us out with this, and even law enforcement, just to give you an idea of how, how this works. And finally, just how important this is, you'll notice one uh, comment here talking about us providing updates to our board of directors as to how we're doing. So this is a pretty important thing. This is something that all parts of our company really focus on and are concerned about. And finally, I just wanted to give you a visual. This is our Cyber Technology Operations Center. It's based in, uh, it's a facility that we have in our headquarters in New York City, but all of the screens that you see there are all available virtually. So, um, you know, even if Sarab's not sitting in the CTOC, I'm sure he has access to a lot of these screens right from wherever he is. But this just shows you that we have people monitoring our systems all hours of the day and night, looking for threats, looking for, uh, for cyber bad actors and making sure that they can't get into our systems and they can't affect those $35.2 trillion that our clients trust us to safeguard for them every day. So I hope that was helpful in explaining a little bit about what BNY Mellon does. Now I'm very pleased to introduce to you Saurabh Singh, one of my colleagues based right here in Pittsburgh. Um, he is currently um, a Senior Specialist Information Security Analyst, um, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about his background and his education and his path. You can see his licenses and certifications on the screen, very impressive. But something else I wanted to mention before I turn it over, um, he, like many of us, are very involved outside of his day job and a lot of other things that make our company great. Things like um, working with our employee resource groups, such as Impact, which is a group that uh, is for multicultural employees, and in particular, the Women in Technology Group, which works hard to promote a more diverse and inclusive environment in the STEM industry for women. So with that, I'm very pleased to turn it over to Saurabh Singh, who's going to, uh, to take you through the rest of the program. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, thank, uh, thanks, BDC, for having me. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let me know once you guys are able to see that. I think you are. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and present from current slide. Okay. All right, thanks again, uh, Dave and Pittsburgh uh, to Council to, for inviting me to uh, you know, present on a topic I'm super passionate about. And when people think about cybersecurity, you know, uh, they're not only the good guys, they're bad guys. And, you know, it's always, and one of the main reasons why I got into cybersecurity was just, I grew up reading detective novels, watching thriller movies and stuff, and, you know, always wanted to uh, just find out how you could uncover mysteries and, uh, you know, get the real solution to it. And so, you know, so that's a little intro for myself here. I went to University of Washington in Seattle, uh, straight from India. And uh, after that, I got an opportunity to work with BNY here. So, you know, here I am. And I'm gonna go ahead to the next slide here. And um, all right, here we go. So the first thing I wanna talk about is OWASP. So as Dave stated earlier, we, you know, are really working with professionals, not only within our company, but around the world to keep uh, BNY's applications secure. And one standard we follow is Open Web Application Security Project. Now, you know, to take a step back, a lot of people, a lot of times when people think about hacking, you only hear the negative effect of it, right? Where a company lost billions of dollars, lost customers, uh, a lot of people probably had their social security and stuff taken. And I you know, wanted to, uh, to spin it in another way where as a practitioner, you get to see what I'm doing daily on the job here. And what an interesting thing a lot of people don't know is in cybersecurity, offense is actually the best defense. So what, we, what I mean by that is we actually hack our applications first. So before we send it out into the world and to our clients, we're actually actively trying to hack into our own applications and obviously teach our developers how to code securely. Now, based upon that, one of these standards is the OWASP top 10 here. And what happens here is we, it's an international foundation with over th thousands of professionals basically anonymously uh, telling this organization that, hey, these are the vulnerabilities we're currently seeing. Uh, 
in our organization. And everyone then aggregates the data and then they put it out there. So today I'm gonna to talk about injection, specifically SQL injection and cross-site scripting. So on, onwards we go. So first SQL injection, SQL injection is pronounced SQL and it's an easy way to destroy your database. So what does this mean exactly? I have a little comic strip here. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of XKCD, but if you haven't, I'm sure after this presentation, you're gonna be on there uh, for a long time because what it does is it makes super complex concepts like these super easy. So over here, you basically have a mom calling uh, a school and telling them, uh, you know, uh, did he break something and what his name was. So this mom pretty cleverly puts in a little statement here and by which she crashes the students, the school's database. So it's a little comic humor to start us off there. We're now getting into it, injection. So what does injection mean? Basically an attacker injects, injects a string, which is basically a series of characters that perform some malicious activity like session hijacking, cookie stealing. And the effect here is severe. You're, it's gonna result in a loss of information, den denial of access. And it's one of the most common uh, vulnerabilities you're gonna see in web applications. And the way you discover it is also pretty normal. It's just anytime you see some weird uh, commands that you know on a website that you're not supposed to see or you think might be gibberish, turns out that's actually information a hacker can use to take over that website or that company system. So we keep talking about SQL injection or you know SQL and what is that? So SQL is structured query language. It's used to store, edit, and retrieve database data. Applications issue SQL commands that manage this data. So in essence, SQL is structured query language and it's just related to a database. All the data that uh, you know you interact with on a website whenever you're putting in any passwords and all that, all that's always stored in some kind of database. And what SQL injection is commonly, it's also known as SQLi. Um, once you get into the profession, it basically is a common attack that consists of insertion or injection of the SQL code to the backend database so we can access information we're not supposed to. So what could a successful SQL injection attack result in? Uh, deletion of entire tables, exposure of sensitive company, company data, and attacker gaining admin rights to a database. So how does the SQL code actually look like? So it's gonna look something like this. Unlike most other code, SQL code is kind of straightforward where when it's saying that it's gonna select from users where, what it means is that it's gonna go into this database and it's selecting the certain range of data. So the words here actually are literally going in, when it says from, it's actually going into the database of users and then displaying and trying to search the data. So the SQL command process the logic to determine what to return. Now, in some cases where you know you ask your user ID and you know usually it's some kind of email, could be Robbie93, something of that sort. But if you enter some kind of wrong input, especially if, if a website doesn't have the proper protective measures, say I go ahead and enter this 105 or one equal to one, this is how the database reads it. So, and logically when you say one equal to one, it means it's always two true and this result the results in this input being accepted when it shouldn't happen but this is how almost you know a basic attack can start and another malicious attack is literally when it says drop table that means that it's just uh the table is lost you, your database is crashed and all your data is gone so you know not good in essence and so the code at the server level this is how it reads it so you know if you ever go to you if if you're on a website that's accepting this input, congrats, you've crashed their database. But you know, most websites now don't have this, but on a very basic level, this is kind of you know, what uh, hackers usually check for to see if they're able to cause damage that way. So here's a quick demonstration here. This is an intentionally vulnerable website. So this is called demo.testfire. The whole purpose of this website is that it's riddled with these vulnerabilities. And uh, so people like yourself who want to practice or new to the profession can go here and actually try out these different um, 
different techniques on here to see if you're able to kind of hack into it. So over here, the initial attempt here is it's a simple username password. You put in your username as Donald, but your password, you don't really know. You basically don't have access to this. So you're going to try to see how you can get in. So the first thing you do is maybe you put in a single quote mark. And what happens when we do that? A descriptive error is returned. So if you, you know, if as you're learning, what you see is when you see an error message, it's actually a great thing because this allows us to see where and what is actually going on. So the minute we see this, the first error we see is like error 500 and I'm like, okay, noted. And then I can actually see here where some of the system information is being stored. So uh, again, this is an intentionally vulnerable website. People can go and practice by themselves. And uh, there are a lot of security reports based on this written. So it's a great way to learn. And you know, as you saw here, just by uh, putting in a quotation mark, you're able to see oh, this descriptive error, which is going to help us later to you know, do some malicious stuff. I mean, and, go ahead. Stop here for one moment. You know, looking at all of these things, it's not only fascinating, but it's also really technical. Um, and I know Jesse, our, one of our student panelists, has a question just regarding sort of how you got to be able to master some of these things and work here at BNY Mellon. So before I introduce Jesse, we do have Jesse, Brandon, and Victoria are all our student panelists for today. Um, and they'll be coming on, they'll be asking everyone their polling questions, and they'll be asking everybody or asking our speakers some questions as well. So Jesse, if you don't mind coming on, and Sarab, if you don't mind answering. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jesse, and I'm an upcoming senior. My question is, what was your educational pathway, and how did you get to where you are today? A great question, Jesse. So growing up, I was always around computers, fascinated by that. Um, as you can see, I read a lot of books here. But <laughs> just, uh, you know, I always loved reading, like I said, a lot of detective novels, any crime series, thriller series, I always absorb that, right? Think Criminal Minds and CIS and, you know, they always have one of those tech guys on there and then they throw up a screen, write some commands and they're like, oh, boom, here's the suspect. So I always wondered, uh, you know, what are we doing in real life? Like, uh, is, is it really that easy? Turns out, uh, no, so it, it requires a lot of learning. And I was lucky that my school back home in India was able to provide us computer classes right from uh, as soon as I got into the ninth grade. So the first class I ever took was in Java. And, you know, it wasn't an easy journey for me because it did take me a lot of you know, a large amount of time just to kind of grasp the concept to write, you know, first you start off like, you know, very basic kind of write a, a calculator program, uh, write, write a calendar program, you know, I started, you know, very slowly like that. And if you're interested, you should also right now the language in demand, I would say is Python. So if I were to do, do it all over again, I would start off with Python. And Python's a great language. I use it almost every day. And not only will it help you in cybersecurity, but it'll also help you in data science, in AI, in VR. So, you know, all the buzzwords use Python. So I would say, you know, start off with Python. And then when I got into college, uh, you know, I continued and wanted to major in um, computer science, but kind of shifted over to IT because we had a specialized uh, course that was just all cybersecurity related. And I think the next thing that's important to know as a cybersecurity person is uh, something called Linux. So Linux is this command line. We're going to see some videos on it later. So, you know, starting off with Python, learning Linux, that's going to get you really far in this cloud computing world that we, you know, we are. You always hear cloud. Cloud is usually run on all these Linux systems. So, you know, and after that, I still, you know, I just really wanted to be part of the tech thing. And being in Seattle, I was around, you know, the Microsofts, the Googles, the the apples of the world, all of them were there. So that really helped just being close to proximity to them. As you have here, you know, you have organizations like myself, Uber, Facebook, you know, great organizations and having something like PTC who can be a bridge between always helps. So there's always some organization trying to help. You know, I would try to latch on to that and absorb all, uh, whatever I could. And when I was in college, then my next job, one of my first jobs was actually at the call center there, where it was one of those tech call centers where, you know, we 
uh, helped our university uh, people would call in if they forgot their passwords. So, you know, that's where I started learning more about passwords, about phishing campaigns. Phishing is basically where you think you get a real email, but it's not, it's a malicious email. And then you give them your information and you know, you're basically hacked. So, uh, you know, and one of the first brushes, uh, uh, I got a really good brush on that because of Target. I'm not sure if people remember, but in 2014, Target got hacked and it was a very massive hack. A lot of people had to first, their first foray into getting identity uh, protection, identity insurance kind of start, started with that. So, you know, and I received a lot of calls when I was uh, in, working for the call center there that you know, what do I do? How do I reset my passwords? Uh, and, you know, and that was when I was like, okay, this is when I'm actually going to get into cybersecurity. I thought, well, this is it. You know, if this is going to cause a massive hysteria, like I got to be part of that and obviously be on the good side. And, you know, so, you know, so that's pretty much how I got into it. And then what I do like about cybersecurity compared to like any other uh, field is you're constantly learning. Every day you learn something. Every day there's some new hack you have to protect from. There's always new vulnerabilities being discovered and how you manage that and patch that. And it's always interesting. You're never ever going to get up and be bored and be like, oh, you know, I want to do cyber today. No, cyber, you know, it's like going to the gym. You have to do it every day, you know. So, you know, you want to be healthy. Same thing. Your cyber hygiene has to be on point. And uh, you and it's very structured learning the thing about cybersecurity because you have some great boot camps out there and as you saw earlier like i have a lot of licenses and certifications and that's what i like about cyber is it's very guided it's like okay here are certain procedures we have to do here are some new things you have to learn so you know if if you love learning you cyber is you know where you need to be so for the participants if you guys could all put your hands down for a moment so rob talked about um, learning Python, boot camps, talked about coding. Could you raise your hand if you do have experience with coding already, whether that is through school or through boot camp or through outside summer classes or after school programs? I'm just so interested out of the 200 people we have here today, how many of you have experience with coding? Jesse, raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, that number keeps going up. We're up to like almost- Love it participants. I mean, that is fantastic. And it's a message we've seen over and over to really get practice with coding. So Rob, is this the time for the polling question? Or do you want to wait for after the next slide? Uh, you know, why don't we go on to the next slide and then get that? Okay. So Brandon, you're going to be next after this slide asking us a question. Okay. Uh, so what's going on here is we're now testing for an admin account. So what you have to remember is, uh, as you know, if you look at, I think the first foray into like getting into this word admin is probably when you set up a new router. Whenever you set up a new router or you have, uh, you know, uh, the Verizon people come in or Comcast people come in, they always tell you like, hey, this is usually the default password on most routers. Starts off with admin and then the password's usually admin. So, you know, you always want to change your passwords immediately. But in this case, what we do on this intentionally vulnerable website is that we first, first thing is we don't even know if admin's a user here, right? So what we do is we put an admin and then we just click on login. And the first error message we see is login failed, your password appears to be invalid. And what this tells me as an attacker is great. That means admin is somewhere in the system. It doesn't say a username not found. It just says, okay, your password might be invalid. Enter that carefully. And again, trying to remove, you know, if you look under the hood here, this is what's happening. Where when we put in the admin and now we're gonna add these two, these two dashes here. And this is how the SQL statements read on the back end. And voila, we're actually in. So, you know, obviously, pretty poor protection here, but we're learning through this vulnerable website. And just by putting the username as admin and putting this apostrophe in two dashes and no password at all, it just let us in because there were not adequate protect protections there. Wow. Okay. So let's have Brandon ask this question and see what our audience um, thinks as far as going through these multiple choice question answers. Go ahead, Brandon. Um, yes, of course. The question is, what does SQL stand for? String query language, string question language, structured query language, or structured question language? 
All right, let's see how many of you are paying attention. This is fantastic. So yeah, like I said, so Rob's gonna be quizzing everybody throughout the presentation today to see how well you're paying attention. And it looks like we have some participants who are definitely engaged. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Okay, that's Chip. impressive. Well, it... There you go, Sarab. Great, um, structured query language was the right answer. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty happy. A lot of people engaged, let's go. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, so on to the next slide. Okay, so now here, you know, with every hack, with every kind of a SQL injection attack happening, I always want to put, you know, people always ask, what's the dollar of value to this, right? And we have great organizations now, this is a third party organization called HackerOne. So this acts as a bridge between white hat hackers or security researchers, uh, you know, people basically trying to do good and um, between actual organizations where, you know, because as companies become larger and a lot of these websites are spun, you know, not only having an internal security team, but like people who are security researchers um, who, who help out uh, with com uh, keeping a company secure, that's where HackerOne kind of comes into play. So what they do is if I find a vulnerability like we just did in the previous slide, we can make a little security report and send them screenshots like this. Ideally, I would just screenshot this and then send it over as a security report. And then this company in this case, which is Valve, Valve, you know, as you guys know, probably whoever's into gaming, you know, they're uh, they're in charge of Steam. A lot of those games like Half Life. Shout out to Half Life fans. Um, you know, so basically, what happens here is we found the SQL injection vulnerability on this asset, which is SteamPower.com. And once the company reviewed it, which was Valve, they gave the person twenty five thousand dollars. So you know. So this is kind of the money that's just out there where even if you're able to find vulnerabilities like SQL injection, you can get, you know, $25,000 in some cases more. Here's another one called Drive Grab. Uh, Grab is basically, it's in Jakarta, Indonesia, and in Singapore as well, they're Uber's competitors. And again, a SQL injection was found on one of their plugins and they paid pretty handsomely $4,500. So, you know, this is how, you know, people all around the world are actually working to keep organizations secure, not only internally do these organizations have security teams, but they also mobilize people who are super interested in security and then obviously pay them pretty handsomely as well. Itosh has a question for you here. When you're doing this, how many issues do you usually find in your websites when you first check for vulnerabilities? So just on average. Okay, great. On average, I mean, see, I don't think there's, uh, you really can't keep a number on that, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, because if you're looking at external organizations, right, I can only speak to the organization I work for. And, you know, I'm not really authorized to give you out that number. But in general, the way OWASP finds it, you're usually going to find vulnerabilities that are ranked from critical to low. Like, as you saw here, great question, by the way, this brings into this concept of severity. So this is really important because in some cases, because not all vulnerabilities are created are equal. For example, I might find 12 vulnerabilities uh, on a web application, but are all 12 critical? Probably not highly, actually that's highly pretty impossible for it to be like 12 critical vulnerabilities. If we, we might find one critical and then we might find another high. So it's really de depending on how that vulnerability is also executed that, um, you know, that will be able to tell if it's critical, high, medium, or low. So I would say average maybe about 12, and not always are you going to find critical and high vulnerabilities, uh, right? And a lot, a huge part of my job is this, where I do give these similar presentations to my developers inside. So I make sure that, you know, we they don't put up vulnerabilities like these. So, yeah. but you know. <laughs> I, I was going to add that, Sarah, because it's an important point. Our developers scan yeah. their applications as they're being developed. So it's not like we yeah. just write an application, put it into production, and then scan it later. We right. that's a critical part of our development process to catch them even before we release any application. Right. And like I said, just to Dave's point, that's why offense is the best defense in cybersecurity. We're always scanning before our apps are going into production, making sure we're able to catch these vulnerabilities before they're out in the wild. So, uh, so you know, yeah, great question there. 
So we've talked about how we did the attack. Now let's talk about how I help my developers and, and developers in general, how do I save them? Like how, what can we do to protect ourselves from these attacks? So again, some of these, some of this is technical stuff. Maybe you can go home and read about it more or you can take these cheat sheets also for the sake of time. But yeah, again, OWASP comes out with these cheat sheets, which are, which are amazing and you know similar to, to your cheat sheets that you might make for an exam you know it's a simple thing that our developers usually have up on one screen as they're coding and the one thing you need to know is definitely using prepared statements or parameterized queries those stored procedures and also error messaging so like a couple of the vulnerabilities we saw earlier they were giving out these error messages ideally we want to standardize those error messages and not even put out a code Ideally, if we do want to give out an error message, it would just say something that says, oh, oops, sorry, looks like we got to the wrong spot. I know Amazon usually puts up pictures of their dogs on there. So, you know, ideally you want to do something very inane like that instead of, you know, giving hackers information uh, like this. Right. Where, you know, they actually know, okay, oh, wow, this is in the C folder. I can just go there and get it on line 33. Awesome. So, you know, you don't want to have that kind of error message out there. Instead, you know, even just putting up a picture of a dog and just saying, sorry, that works too. That is fantastic. Victoria has a question for everyone who is watching today. I'm going to launch it for you, Victoria. See again what everyone thinks is the best answer. Yeah, my question is, what does OWASP, OWASP stand for? Open Web Application Safety Project. Open Web Application Security Project, Open Web Application Secure Program, or Open Web Application Security Program. Great job. Thank you, Victoria. Go ahead and log in your answer. What do you think OWASP stands for? Looks like we're battling between number two and number four right now. We'll just give another second here. Yeah, when I made this question, I was wondering, I thought it would be between two and four. You know, these test makers, they always try to trick you, see if you guys can, can beat the hacker here. All right, I'm going to share the results. And, uh, well, you know, the, an the correct answer is actually B, Open Web Application Security Project, which could be, I think, found on slide nine, maybe. Um, on there, had I let them to go longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, but again, that's OWASP is one thing, you know, just knowing that and putting that on a resume, that's what, you know, would take you immediately to the hiring manager. So that's great for them to know. Things like that are so important. So think students that you, things you can focus on. Um, and we had a question in here, just locally in Pittsburgh, what do you think is the best school um, right now to look at if you wanted to do an undergrad program? Um, CMU for sure. See me, but even Pitt, but I think, you know, when it comes back, let me dial it back to where, you know, now with, to, with boot camps like Tech Elevator getting on there and some, I believe like Flatiron School, I think they've taken it online too because of the COVID pandemic that, you know, you, that not necessarily caught, I wouldn't say that college was going to be replaced by them, but even, you know, if you didn't have, if you couldn't afford that, then you have options of these two that exclusively like Flatiron School, Tech Elevator, they're directly just teaching you this, that right? Yeah, so these kids can leave high school, go into some of these boot camps, yes. new certifications, get these licenses and really end up making a nice living and learning a lot. Right, right out of high school, you could be doing that. And I know some organizations and boot camps, uh, the name escapes me, but a lot of them also, um, like their, their tuition is free until you get a job and then you pay them off, you know, after you get a job. So a lot of great options out there. And one beautiful thing about cybersecurity is people are so open. Even if you ever go to a conference, I know there's a Three Rivers Security Conference that happens every year and B-Sides Pittsburgh. All these are organizations through OWASP and I volunteer for some of them. And, uh, you know, just come to the conference, come talk to these people. And what you're going to find out about cybersecurity people are these people are the most open and social and, you know, they're always willing to coach and mentor and, you know, just talk you through to get to where you need to be. That is fantastic. I know you had some videos that you wanted to show us too. I just want to make sure I'm getting everything in in the time that we have allotted. So I'm going to quit bothering you and let you keep going. Sure. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move on to my other favorite vulnerability, uh, cross-site scripting. 
So here again, we're at my favorite comic strip here where cross-site scripting is basically putting bad code into good code. So what's exactly happening here is again, she gives this uh, sly mom always, she's always sending out some kind of script alert and stuff. So basically here she puts in a little script and because of that, she basically uh, was able to down the website. So the website was no longer, uh, was no longer up because of just her putting in this alert and script. So what is that? Let's find out. So script, a script is a computer language with a series of commands in a file that can be executed without being compiled. And the key a word here is without. So in order, so you're executing a file without being compiled. So that's super important there. And usually how this attack is executed is an attacker sends malicious code to uh, a different end user and uh, when the end user gets it, they're basically executing it without even knowing it. And that's the scary part about this vulnerability. Like you could be just going in and um, just going visiting a website. And if that website is already tainted, the attacker is already in your system. Or it, the attacker could cleverly put in a script that says, hey, just enter your login or, 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 enter, or enter your password or something. And uh, unbeknownst to you, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna be giving control over to the attacker. And this is kind of how it works pretty much. You in, attacker inserts some unfiltered code in the, into the application, into the website, the user visits the website and the code immediately runs and the attacker boom, gains control of your system. So how does this look from a user perspective? You just log in and you don't know if there's a script or not, or what it does is they cleverly give you a question uh, or they might tell you like, hey, you need to put in your username again in order to run this website. And once the script is executed, you're infected. So quick example of this, this is an again, again uh, one of my favorite third party tools that we use uh, here. It's again, free to the public. You can again, um, you know, come here and practice this whenever you're, you need to. It's called Damn Vulnerable Web Application, DVWA. So what's happening here is you go there and what the user is, he's just trying to select French and when we go and look into the actual code of uh, the application here, you're gonna see that there are basically no protections. So as an attacker, I'm thinking, okay, great, no protections, time for me to put in my little handy script here. And boom, that's what I do. I put, go ahead, put in my little script, gives this alert, one, two, three. And obviously at one, two, three is just an example. It could be any malicious thing that could be put in there. But the important part is the minute you selected French, this thing came up because I uh, put in this code. And here are some recommendations on how you fix that. A lot of that, again, we go to our open web application security project links. They give us a lot of cheat sheets. Mozilla has given us cheat sheets. And the interesting part is a lot of browsers like Chrome now, because this vulnerability is so rampant, uh, they were able to create some security, content security policies. That's again, uh, mitigation control here. Um, but yeah, so this is pretty much, uh, how we go about protecting XSS. And uh, again, let's uh, see what, how does it look in the real world, the dollar value to it. So it looks like this vulnerability was found in, uh, in Uber. And again, on one of the Uber websites. And once it was reported again, like I said, this was classified as a medium vulnerability. So like I said, not all vulnerabilities are created equal, especially uh, depending on how the organization has that. Like you could stand up a website, but if that website doesn't have a database and we're doing these attacks, you know, great that you found it, you'll get a kudos, but you know, you're, a lot of damage is not gonna happen. So that's sometimes those vulnerabilities are then classified with a severity of low. So as you can see here, we classify, they classified this as a medium and uh, a medium and they paid uh, the person $3,000. Same thing with here, DuckDuckGo, they don't show us well. They classified this as a high. DuckDuckGo is a competitor of Google without the ads. So, you know, if you don't like the ads of Google and they're tracking you, you can use DuckDuckGo. But, you know, vulnerability was found there. Again, when it was reported, as you can see, they just put in a little script here. So it's kind of, you know, kind of crazy how even a little script can cause a lot of reputational damage to certain companies. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. And uh, I'm not sure if you have any questions before I uh, jump into some of my favorite hacking videos here.
I mean, we have some great questions, but I know that they really want to see the hacking video. So I'm going to let you great. do those and then we'll finish up with questions. Perfect. I'm going to stop sharing and see if I can. OK, you know what? I think we have one right here. And are you able to see this, Marie? Looks good. Looks good. Great. So as you can see here, just to I'm going to do give you a little commentary just so you know what's happening here. So what's happening here is we're in this uh, operating system called Kali Linux. So this is, like I said, again, a Linux based system here, uh, completely different from Windows and Mac. And uh, what's happening here is in Kali Linux, it already comes with a bunch of security tools. If you're a security professional, you will always interact with Kali Linux. So over here, we're calling something called the Harvester, which is basically like a, um, a tool that we can use to see what information's already out there. So what we're doing here is called passive information ga gathering. And this basically automatically searches Google and other results and gives you an aggregated information. And why you're going to do this is also for security reasons. This is one of the alma maters of my um, a team member who made this video. So you're going to see a lot of Lemoyne.edu uh, emails. But again, like you see here, again, this information is freely available. If you have Kali Linux, you put in this harvester command and uh, you know put in like a university or anyone's email on there, you, you're, able, you're going to get some information back, which is all obviously freely public. But look at when they run this who is command. So the who is command basically shows who the domain is registered to. So I'm able to get information like, okay, who the network manager is, where they're at, what servers they're using. Again, this is all uh, bits and pieces of information you, you need uh, in order to execute a hack. Obviously, as the good guys, this is when we go back and tell these people like, hey, this information is freely available online. Are you good with that? So as a good guy hacker, you're going to go back, tell the company like, listen, we found this information uh, and all that. And usually any information that's found in who is is the organization knows that it's out there. But again, there are various ways that people can craft phishing emails and attacks based on that. So. Um, I'm just going to continue here and uh, and see if, and yeah, there you go. So that's kind of pretty much all there is to it. And then once you get some of the information there, you're going to go and just by Googling, you're able to see what kind of Java environment it's running, what kind of other information it has. And again, based on, you know, what information you find here, you know, you are, you're going to craft a tax accordingly to that. So now that I know that it's in the Java 2 runtime environment, I'm going to maybe craft my attack based on that. So that's our first video there. We have two more to go. And just to let you know, I know we have probably about five, 10 more minutes okay. um, before we end up getting cut off, but keep going. Okay, great. Uh, in that case, I'm gonna just show you one more video, which uh, I like a lot. Just give me one moment, please. Yeah, take your time for me. I've never seen anything like that in action. So this is this is pretty amazing. And again, just the importance of going to some of those boot camps, learning to code, learn, learning how to fight things when they are so easily found this way. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, we're back up here. Are you able to see my screen, Marie? Yes. Great. Perfect. So what we're doing here now is called active information gathering. Now this, the stuff we run here, you need to have explicit permission to do this. You know, if, cause if you get caught, you're good. You're looking at some time here. So this is not something you want to practice on, uh, on any existing organization without their permission. Obviously when you go to boot camps and all that, everyone has specific labs and permissions and fake websites and stuff that you can practice on. But stuff we're doing here, we had permission to do back uh, back when my teammate was in college, he was able to do that for a school project. So this, what you're seeing right here was basically his final project for his network security class. And what he's doing here is he's using this tool called Nmap on an IP address to see what he's gonna get back. So I'm gonna play again here and let's see what we see. Again, this is a script he's running and he wants to know what what's the OS on this uh, operating system on this IP. 
So as he's running this tool, he's waiting for the results here and boom, he sees a lot of information. So let's break this down, shall we? So we're able to see different ports open. And again, ports are something we need to know and see, uh, you know, as an attacker, this is all information I need when I'm crafting an attack. I'm like, okay, great. I see companies like VMware. I see this. he's a Unix operating system. I see his computer's name. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, this is great information. Let me see what I do next. So basically what he's trying to do as an analogy is it, it's almost as if a, a, a raw, you know, a, someone is coming to your house and is basically trying to see if he's able to, you know, get in through the doorknobs, get in through the windows, which, you know, obviously is not cool. It's the same way. If you're not doing this in a professional setting or in a boot camp, then I highly encourage you not to do this. So this is something you should be doing in your own, you know, kind of labs or on intentional websites or uh, intentionally vulnerable websites like DVWA. So as we keep going, uh, the next command we're about to run uh, after we get this information is we're gonna clear it first and then we're gonna run one more end map and we're gonna run a different command now to see uh, on the ports. So we saw 139, 445 ports open and we're running this command to see, okay, what do we get here now? And we're trying to see if it's vulnerable on those ports. And if you're wondering where, how we know what these scripts are, again, these are available online. When you take a couple of classes or you're highly curious, you'll be able to get that, get that also. So these are just some common scripts that we're always gonna use. And as you can see, we get some more uh, information here that, okay, let's, I'm gonna pause this and we're gonna see what the information is here. We're gonna, we're getting an error. We're seeing that it's vulnerable to, to this and that it's not vulnerable to this. So it's important to kind of first check what it's vulnerable to and what it's not. And once that's done, we're gonna try and uh, try some more techniques to see that, like I said, you'll see that it's uh, vulnerable to that kind of attack. We're gonna clear that and let's now try to craft an attack according to that. So the next thing we're doing is we're gonna be enumerating this Linux, which again means we're gonna put in a different command and try to see what information we can get. We get no passwords, but the good thing we have here is again, we see these usernames. These usernames is what we need. Admin, guest, all these are, you know, usernames uh, that are always out there. And these are, uh, these are there for the reason because they're the most common. They're kind of like an industry standard, but the problem is people forget that when you have an admin username, you need to change the password later. Oh, but let's pause the video here and you can see that I'm already getting information, running a few commands on how the passwords are. Looks like the maximum password length is five. Password complexity is not much. There's, you don't need any, ma there's basically no restrictions here. We see what the duration is. And so, you know, I'm getting all this information here and thinking, okay, there's not a lot of protection on these password policies. Maybe I can craft some kind of password uh, attack onto this and get, get into the system. I just kind of move this forward here for the sake of time. So again, like I said, this is all the password information we have. And we're thinking, okay, uh, no lockout admins, no clear change, zero, zero, zero. This looks good. And we're going to continue. And now we're going to put in another command. And what this command essentially is doing is basically making a password dictionary with all the alphabets. And because we saw the maximum password complexity as five, we're gonna put in all the alphabets and in five letter combinations. So now within just this one, I love computers, with this, with this one command, I'm able to make a huge password list um, of about 11 million lines of possible passwords that I can try. And my next step is now I'm gonna try to put these passwords in there because I know, and I'm using this tool called Medusa uh, to, to put this in there. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna put in this IP address again, and I'm gonna say that use the passwords I generated from this file, evilwordlist.txt, and see if I'm able to get in there or not.
Boom, we did that. And we put in our command. Uh, again, the tool we're using here is Medusa. And we're also specifying some more information. And we're definitely specifying that we need to get into this admin account because that holds the most privileges. And boom, we checked it and looks like account found and username and password. So it looks like we were able to get in pretty easily because uh, this was the first thing we tried and looks like the password this intentionally vulnerable website was using was five A's. So another yeah. takeaway is uh, don't have your password as five A's. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean. Rob, we have so many good questions here, and I know I have to throw it back to Audrey. Um, and so I just want to tell everybody in the Q&A, I definitely am going to send some of these questions to Sarab and we're going to get some of these answers back to you because there's questions like as a high school student, what do you think the best ways to gain exposure? What should you do to protect yourself from hacks? Um, specific questions just about the work that you did on Google websites. Um, so there's so many good questions, and but we're going to get cut off. So I'm going to throw it back to Audrey. I cannot appreciate this enough. This was something I'd never seen before. Um, so thank you, Audrey. I'm going to have you wrap it up, but yeah. Q&A will get to you. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, this is amazing. And my takeaway from this is we just need to do a regular series with the folks at BNY to really just talk about security because Happy it, to. it's just, it's, it's too much. It's, it's exciting and the opportunities are real. And I cannot thank you enough for being able to allow us to just, you know, experience some of this and understand the, you know, the work that you're actually doing. And thank you, Dave, for setting the stage for the, for the work that BNY actually is responsible for. Many people don't understand that when they think of companies, they don't really understand what the responsibilities are in terms of the work and the impact that you're having. So my hat's off to both of you for taking the time with us. I just wanna you know, thank our sponsors who have helped us with this. I wanna thank all the attendees. Send your questions to Marie. We are continuing to shape this work. This is just the beginning. We use this as an opportunity during the pandemic, but we are convinced that there are lots of pathways for us to strengthen this. Thank you for talking about you know, college and, um, you know, not college and alternatives. I think that's so important. It's important, not just because again, that our, you know, economics have changed, but it's also in terms of the kind of skills that we all need. And we just learn all the time. So I, again, I can't thank you. I really just want to give a reminder. Those of you also our sponsors are people who hire people who are in STEM technology, engineering, and math. So BNY Mellon, Giant Eagle, they've been our gold sponsors. They're, they've been our partner. They really want to have an impact. Yeah. Same thing with uh, Silver, with Lanxus. They are, have been based in Pittsburgh and they're doing a lot of things in terms of material science and uh, SDLC partners in terms of consulting. So many opportunities there. And we have a bronze sponsors of CGI and Industrial Scientific. If you're in Pittsburgh and you go near the airport, you can see the big sign for Industrial Scientific. They do a lot of safety work there. I mean, it's just endless. And then we have our supporting sponsors, another startup that's doing some great things in financial tech and gift cards called Giftja. And then of course, Highmark. I'm running out of breath. I thank you all for your work. This is, and I thank all of you for joining us. Give us feedback tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a woman that is going to be with us and she it works on autonomous vehicles and we're going to get a little bit of a virtual tour we're going to peel it back a little bit so people are working behind the scenes we're here to try to share it with all of you thank you marie thank you for being our in-house staff nerd she is a math and science teacher and she is awesome rocking it and thank you to bny thanks audrey thanks for having thank us thank you